those people that speak non-tonal languages. So a tonal language is unlike English, uh, languages like Chinese, Thai, Yoruba, Zulu, and various other languages where the pitch of what you say adjusts the meaning of the word. Now, without going any further than observing the correlation, what they show is that when these two genes are infrequent in the population, these are peoples that speak tonal languages. Where they are both common in the population, these are people who do not speak tonal languages. There are a mixture of peoples in the top left-hand side, and there's nobody in the bottom right-hand side, uh, facts for which they don't have any explanation. So these are, these are a few pieces of a very large jigsaw. They don't tell a whole story, but they certainly raise some intriguing questions about genes, brain size, language, and so on. And brain size has been a theme of the argument put forward by a number of people, including Christo Christopher Wills, uh, a, a popularizing evolutionary biologist who published a, a recent book called The Runaway Brain. And the essence of his argument is that the human mind has shaped the environment, and thinking what I, remembering what I said earlier about nature and nurture interacting together, once the mind of man has shaped the environment, then this complex environment is further stimulus to uh, shape the mind. And that's the runaway process he's talking about. That's the positive feedback process that he's talking about. Um, so quite possibly, the human brain is uh, a focus, uh, a point uh, of evolutionary development, and we know very little about it so far. Now, there's another group of genes that are interesting. They, interestingly, have been called adventure genes in some settings. These are the dopamine receptors. Now, dopamine is a, a neurotransmitter. It, that is a chemical that transmits signals between neurons in your brain. And the dopamine receptor is associated with a number of different emotional aspects of character. It's associated with certain kinds of neurological dysfunction like autism and depression and so on. Um, but it's also associated with aggressiveness, adventurousness, if you like. And a survey of the distribution of gene variants of the dopamine receptor around the world has revealed the picture which you see summarized in this chart here. Now, in particular, the adventure gene is supposedly the 7 version of this gene. There's 2, 4, and 7, and it doesn't really matter what the difference between them is. Just to note that in Asia, the frequency of this gene is higher in populations that have migrated more in recent human history, over the last hundreds and thousands of years. So compare these island populations here with these more sedentary Asian populations here. And the other contrast that's being made is between the South American Yanomami Indians of Brazil, who have been called the fierce people in one ethnography, versus the Bushmen of Southern Africa, who have been called the harmless people in another ethnography. And that's a point made by Henry Harpending again. He argues that maybe it's no coincidence that these different people have given, been given these different labels. This is on the verge of speculation. The basic fact is that these gene variants are at different frequency in these different populations, and that might impart different characteristics with a genetic basis to those different populations. Now, uh, another intriguing example of evolution uh, arises with a so-called TRB culture. Now, TRB is uh, shorthand for the the Germanic and Dutch name for these people. These people are called the funnel beaker culture in, in, uh, in English. Um, they make beakers of this kind that have these uh, characteristic funnels um, for which the Dutch is the trechterbeker culture. And these people are known for a variety of different um, developments, cultural developments. Uh, one of them is some of the earliest wheeled carts that are used by civilizations in Northern Europe. But more importantly, they also raised cattle. And in raising cattle, they used those cattle for meat and also for milk. And when you drink milk, you have to be lactose tolerant. And there is strong selection pressure for lactose tolerance in cattle rearing populations. You have to have a lactase gene to break down the lactose in milk. And it's a well-known fact, or now a well-known fact, 
that the people of southern Scandinavia, the Netherlands, and neighboring areas are almost entirely lactose tolerant. It's extremely rare that people are not lactose tolerant in those populations. But more recently, in the last one or two years, the question of lactose tolerance has been explored in African populations. And the finding from a study of 43 different cattle herding groups in different parts of Africa is that lactose tolerance, first of all, evolved quite recently, about 3,000 years ago, perhaps somewhere between 3 and 5,000 years ago. There are a variety of different mutations that can allow lactose tolerance. So you, in other words, you can do the physiology in a number of different kinds of ways. And that all of those different mutations have been very strongly selected for. And the finding from these African populations is that of cattle herders is that the advantages of being lactose tolerant are so great that people, in order for these genes to reach the frequencies they've reached, must have had an approximately tenfold reproductive advantage over those individuals who did not carry lactose tolerance genes. So that's a problem that needs to be solved by evolution, and evolution has solved it in a number of different ways, first in European cultures and also in African cultures as well. Now, <clears throat> Decode Genetics is a, a well-known company operating out of Iceland, which has courted controversy ever since they decided to gene sequence the entirety of the Icelandic population. So everybody in Iceland has been investigated by DECODE, all 270,000 inhabitants. And the screening of the Icelandic population has led to some fascinating discoveries about, in this instance, who it is that has more children and what kinds of genes they have. And what has been found by the man on the left and the team of people that work with him is that women who have an altered chromosome 17 have about 3 to 4% more children in the Icelandic population. So there's a selective advantage, and that's not a small selective advantage. And in fact, if that particular version of that chromosome occurred everywhere, or it, if it had the same effects everywhere, in the same way, then that gene would be far commoner in the human population. But the twist of the story appears to be that there are also disadvantages in having that version of chromosome 17, so that it's advantageous in Icelandic and northern European populations, but it's disadvantageous in other populations. And there's another gene close to the one that causes the variant that is also known to be associated with complications in pregnancy. And so it may be that different people in different parts of Europe have different versions of the same gene. But these genetic screening projects that are now underway, they attract controversy because people believe that they're having valuable evidence about themselves that is now in the public domain and strongly object to that. But the scientific power of these studies is immense and the discoveries that they're reporting are incredible. Now, not moving away from reproduction at the moment, you'll remember the person in the middle here. This is vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin. And you'll also remember <coughs> that's not her baby. That's the baby of her teenage daughter. And Sarah Palin's teenage daughter having her baby during the presidential election campaign in the United States reignited the debate about teenage pregnancy, both in North America and, of course, it sparked a debate in Europe and the United Kingdom as well. And a number of interesting studies have looked at teenage pregnancy recently with some interesting genetic results. The general point I want to make here is that culturally, we tend to think of teenage pregnancy as a cultural problem. But there is actually, apparently, a genetic basis for teenage pregnancy as well. And that was the result of a study carried out in Australia last year, which looked at Australian twins and found that there was a strong genetic, an underlying genetic basis to teenage pregnancy. And you can understand why that might be so. Of course, the reproductive advantage to teenage pregnancy is if you have children early, you can have more of them. And that's likely to be selected in the population. And so the speculation made by these Australian researchers is that women are evolving into two kinds. And I use the word evolve in a very loose way there. There's a genetic pressure to have children earlier, 
because those are the children that are going to be selected for, but there's cultural pressure to have children later. And we may get, we've got a cultural tension versus a genetic process. And, well, this is how it's played out in the British press recently. Teenage pregnancy, following the Sarah Palin story, was back on the agenda. And it was back on the agenda, backed by the statistic, that conception in 15 to 17-year-old girls increased from 40.9 per thousand to 41.9 per thousand between 2006 and 2007. And the tabloid press was covered in pictures 